Good morning, Jack Teeling. What a pleasure to have you on our podcast today. So thank you very much for joining um, and taking some time out of your busy, busy life, I'm sure. For I, I thought it would be a good place to start is let's maybe not assume that everyone knows um, your face. Uh, so for those who may be less in the know, who are you, Jack, and, and what is it that you do? Yeah, well, look, delighted firstly to be on uh, your podcast uh, and just a little introduction of who I am. I'm Jack Teeling. I'm the founder and managing director of the Teeling Whiskey Company. I founded it in 2012 with uh, a vision of bringing our old family brand back to life, bringing the stilling back to the city center of Dublin in Ireland, uh, but more importantly, to bring uh, the breath and choice in the premium end of the Irish whiskey market that I didn't think was actually there. So I felt there was a great opportunity and a need for Irish whiskey to have a full let's say, repertoire of unique and differentiated offerings to allow the category to expand and continue to grow and to really tap into, I suppose, the consumer interest in in, in new, interesting, and, and maybe a little bit more, let's say, younger uh, 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 approach to a very traditional category. So so that's that's where it came from and uh, 11 years into the journey here at Hamster. 11 years or plus, plus nearly, nearly 12 years now. It'll be 12 years. Come I know we're in a new year. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's see. We're going to explore that a little bit, but just to go back, I mean, 11 years, obviously, um, there was a career before that. Am I right in thinking you started your career in, in finance? Is that right? Well, (laughs) we're going right back to the, I know that's a long time ago. Yeah. It's like, it's, that's, I feel very old when I realize uh, when I went to university. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's gray hairs that I have. Uh, but uh, I started off just in, 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 in doing management. I specialized in finance for a master's, ended up working in investment banking for a couple of years, went to Australia, worked over there, uh, came back to Ireland. My father had uh, uh, started the distillery in 1987 first new distillery in Ireland at the time broke a monopoly called Cooley Distillery. I grew up with all that in the background and so forth. But my view was I'd never work with my father or for my father just because of the dynamics and so forth. But I must have come back in a very positive frame of mind because uh, he invited me to come in and I went in and I, I was working there for a while and I saw an opportunity. I saw I saw a firsthand that Irish whiskey was going through this this growth phase, and uh, oh. we felt there was an opportunity for me to help with what he was doing, but also to to, to get involved in in making something and making something traditionally hundred uh, percent Irish could survive globalization. I had a real global opportunity, and I went back and I studied a bit in, in international business and so forth to upskill myself. And luckily enough, I became the sales and marketing director there, then became the managing director, and. I was there when it was sold to Beam uh, Inc., as it was called back then in 2009, 2012. And I took my knowledge from working in Cooley uh, and my insights, consumer insights, uh, and I, uh, you know, started afresh. But with, you know, again, I suppose the experience and reputation and contacts that I generated over 10 years working in the industry. Yeah. And I guess that's quite important when you're starting because it's, it's a very niche industry to enter as a new entrepreneur. And I guess that that, that knowledge and that that connection and those relationships are really important um, for, for getting hit in the ground running, would you say? Definitely. I, I do think you need to have an insight into the, the, the business. Uh, mm. So you can be attracted towards it, uh, but unless you know how the challenges and the pitfalls that you can fall into very easily, uh, it is quite, there's a lot of barriers to entry. Um, um, uh, you know, so it's easy to, uh, now it's easy to get supply of whiskey, be it in Scotland or America or in Ireland and uh, have a brand, but that's, that's fine. That doesn't necessarily set you up for success. Uh, mm. you really need to understand consumers that are in the fate in, in, you know, or buying the products. You understand the challenges of route to market and, financing and all this sort of stuff like that. So, so I think, and also there's a credibility um, challenge that if you're new in it, people, you have to generate the trust. Uh, and as you say, relationships that take, take some time to, to do. So I was lucky I could kind of leverage on that, but I would put pressure on, I didn't want to screw it up. So you're only one bad whiskey or one bad uh, release away from losing all that credibility that you can build up. So I suppose that's why we put a lot of emphasis into the quality of our whiskey, particularly at the start. Yeah. And, and we continue to do so. 
that's that is an interesting um take because we'll, we'll be talking to um another distiller um of rye whiskey um over in the US and one of the things that she uh, mentioned was this idea of because there's this length that you put all this time into flavor and um and then you you have to just sit and wait for a while and there's a huge amount of risk involved in that um because you know I can imagine the pressure of just thinking, what if this doesn't actually taste the way that I was anticipating it would taste? Um, so there's a lot of risk in new flavors. And um, and of course, that interest, that that insight pays off and it, it's paying off for T-Lang. Yeah. And it's, it's, again, surrounding, it wasn't just me. I, I brought in uh, Alex Chasco as our master distiller, you know, blender, early stage. So it was sounding boards there to work with. Um, and also, even when we were, we were launching our very first release, we worked with the Irish Whiskey Association, uh, um, which were you know, knowledgeable uh, society, sorry, Irish Whiskey Society right. uh, Association. That's, that has come afterwards. Uh, but that in terms of knowledgeable consumers to taste it and, and to sense check that we were going the right direction to, you know, so so uh, not relying on our own insights and, and, and you know, palates, but, you know, we in the early stage, it was very useful to use them as a sounding board to just make sure we were doing something interesting and different because we were very keen on doing something that was adding to the category, not just, oh, it's another red breast or it's another, you know, Jemison or whatever. Um, we wanted to, to bring something in that was adding. Um, so we weren't trying to rob. We were trying to rob from other categories and bring them to Irish whiskey rather than trying to rob from, from the existing, you know, uh, Irish category. Yeah, and, and reinforce the value of, of why that category exists and, and has its own legacy. Yeah. Um, before we go into a, a little bit of that, how is it like, obviously, you were immersed in the family business at, at Cooling. You started your own business with your brother. I know what it's like to work with your brother. <laughs> What's Jim, it like working with I'm, Stephen? You should be asking him. I'm the older brother, so uh, I don't think, well, it's a little bit like father, son, older brother, younger brother dynamic. Uh, so Stephen, Stephen uh, joined uh, Team Whiskey in 2013. Uh, he stayed on a little bit longer to, um, I suppose, learn or not learn what bigger companies uh, do and what they do well and so forth. So he worked a bit with Beam with the rollout of, of, of the Irish whiskeys within them. Um, so he joined uh, um, then. And uh, what, what's great about working with family is, is, is again, trust. Um, that uh, you, It's very hard to get with other people because you always the back of your mind is like, are they on the same page? Normally with family members, you are on the same page. And obviously having a brand and a company with our surname um, it's it's good to have more teelings involved to share the load and go around the world, meet people and so forth. So in particularly in the early days when we had to do a lot of the the heavy lifting directly ourselves, uh, uh, meeting our, our customers, meeting, you know, consumers and so forth, uh, it was very, very useful to, to spread the load. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, he brings his own insight and energy and so forth. So, so we worked well as a, as, as a team. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, it, it, there's a team of people there and a lot of the people who are still with us were there from the start. So, well, at least they all bought oh, wow. into the vision, um, and have been there for the journey as we have developed over the last, you know, as you said, 11 years. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, actually, naturally you've created a dynamic where they're all working to a shared goal that that passion that exudes from both you and, and Stephen is, is coming through into people staying and believing in what they're creating with you. So I think that's a really important dynamic with, um, with family run businesses naturally, but um, it's coming through. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, just I was lucky to have the, the wider um, team teeling as we call it. Yeah. Well, hopefully at one point I get to meet them all. Um, that that wasn't an, an invitation, but if you want to invite yeah, me yeah, over well, to Dublin, I'm, a, I'm really happy. It's a, it's a, it's a warm <laughs> Irish welcome for for you to come to our distillery. Uh, Fantastic! It's, it's in the city centre of Dublin, very accessible, um, and uh, can be part of a weekend uh, in, in in Dublin or part of a, a, a wider kind of tour around the, the country because everyone comes through Dublin, thankfully, so uh, makes us very accessible. Oh, fab. Well, we'll make sure that there's a link uh, to any visitors who want to come by uh, the distillery. I can imagine that's quite a worthwhile experience. So let's talk about just a little bit about, you touched on it earlier about 
this world of whiskey, you wanted to create something that was actually adding to the to the Irish whiskey um, segment, but also be a, a global player as well. Is the world of premium whiskey here to stay? Do you reckon? Has it has it had its time? Do you think? Well, I, I'm you know for Irish whiskey, uh, whiskey in general, premiumization, I feel is it's, it's it's here to stay, and I do think it's it's down to a multitude of different reasons. Um, you know, people will drink less but better. You know, like it's happened in every other category. It's continuing to happen. Um, it's it's at the early stage with Irish whiskey. It's well defined within American whiskey, or sorry, with uh, Scottish whiskey. Uh, it's developing with American whiskey and so forth. So so the, the, this this trend is is you know it's it's well established um, and it's going to happen at different paces around the world. You know, there's still a sense of discovery for entry level whiskeys in emerging markets. Um, in markets like China, which are, the premiumization has, has very, happened very fast. Wow! Yes, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. And then India, you know, again, is happening at different, different, different stages. So, so globally, it 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 is happening. It will probably, perhaps, slow down slightly in in more mature markets, but accelerate in other markets. So, on the global trend, consumer trend in general, I don't think that's going anywhere. Obviously, when times are a little bit tighter, um, uh, you know, we're going through, you know interstate cycles and so forth, it does slow it down, makes it a little bit more challenging. People are a little bit more mindful. But I think that, you know, let's say the consumer trend or the, you know, intrinsic, you know, desire to try different things and be willing to pay a little bit more, it's not, it's not going anywhere. And with Irish whiskey in particular, it's just at a very early stage of, of happening. And the reason why it hasn't happened is because there hasn't been so much choice within the category. That is, and most of the growth has still just happened within the, the you know, if you look at the standard distribution, it's happening mainly in the, in the middle. Um, so the tails, um, the premium, super premium end is, is, is only at the early stages of, of, evolu- of evolutions. Well, that's really interesting. So not only are you establishing a brand, you're actually reestablishing um, an Irish legacy, if, if you will, because you're, you're offering more choice, you're, you're promoting um the fact that actually it has a, a part to play in this wider industry of whiskies and dark spirits and and premium spirits. Um, that's that's quite a purposeful approach. Well, when 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 we were setting up, the vision was, yeah, we are Irish, but we play in premium whiskey, premium spirit. To be honest with you, um, I do think it's people aren't as compartmentalized as they used to be in terms of I'm a Scotch drinker, I'm a American whiskey. No. I have a repertoire of brands that, that I consume within the spectrum of what I'm willing to pay. So, so you know, we saw the opportunity was bigger than what, what Irish was, but look, that's our DNA. That's who we are. We'll always be, you know, consider that, but for us, the brand was, was in a premium brand space and, and that's exciting, but it's even more challenging uh, because it's so competitive and there's so many people out there screaming for yeah. attention. Um, yeah. So, so it's a challenge, and again, it's just when you're building the premium end of of Irish whiskey, there's a lot of hard work that needs to go into it. It doesn't just happen overnight. You have to justify why this part of of, of of the Irish whiskey category deserves to have a range of offerings. And I think we've done a pretty good job as an industry over the last ten years, you know, giving consumers the confidence that you know these premium Irish whiskeys that cost more money are interesting and and deserve to be in their, you know, whiskey collection. Um, as a marketer, um, uh, we talk a lot about personas and um, to help us picture what uh, our customers are like or um, act like. Or Do you have a, a picture of what an avid, loyal, teeling whiskey drinker is? Yeah, it's, it's, const- it's constantly evolving, um, uh, you know. Um, you know, before teeling whiskey was... You know, just consumers were slightly older, uh, um, um, but you know, over the last fifteen years, it's definitely the 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 size of the prize of younger people entering the category, and younger being I'm talking like 21, 20, you know, early, really early twenties all the way up to and, and our our we start off our demographic was yeah. let's say twenty one to like thirty five, but it, it's it's increased because I've got older. So. <laughs> No, it just feels so much younger. Yeah, yeah, but no, it's, it, and there is a, it's a quite a diverse. So it depends on where you go. And like, if you go to a whiskey show in, let's say, and just pick our home, 
country because when I was growing up, it was very much an older person's drink. But now it's there is this this kind of interesting dynamic of you do like whiskey live in in Dublin or you know you do a whiskey tasting. You'll get this 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 two different cohorts. You get an older cohort and you get a younger cohort, and it's missing this kind of cohort in the middle. Um, um, but it's really interesting dynamic, and, and you know a higher percentage of women and so forth um, interested in learning and, and uh, you know getting into the category. So so it's a really exciting time. Um, but you know, people are drinking as cocktails, uh, you know, drinking straight, uh, coming into it in true different ways. And, you know, but what I find is the most exciting is that they want to learn. They are open to learning. So yes, they, they, they are attracted to brands, but they want to connect. It's not just about being on, you know, billboards and all that kind of stuff like that. It's all about having uh, emotional connection, sharing similar values. But also, you know, uh, uh, providing them with the choice and range of of offerings that they're looking for, and that's that's a challenge. Yeah. You know, that you know, people are looking for new things all the time. Um, as a brand, you want to tap into that, but you know, at some stage, you can do nearly too much and you confuse consumers, especially when they're new coming into the category. So, so there's it's it's a there's a bit of tension there in terms of the need for new product development, but also ensuring that you are creating a sustainable range of of expressions that can can grow uh, uh um, so you're not just cannibalizing yourself um there's a, there's an interesting take there on on and how actually it's beyond the physical and how we're now just trying to create experiences and and educational opportunities um for the the final consumer um let's delve out into that in a little bit but let's talk about choice Right, we, we have way too much now. Um, that's that's a blessing, but it's also a curse. Um, and we talk about this a lot in what in our work with clients is, is shelf appeal. Now, perhaps we talk about it too much, but how does tealing go about standing out against? Um, perhaps it's not even standing out. It's it's reinforcing a more youthful um, Irish whiskey brand. Or but, but how does it ensure? on a shelf, if you are, or the digital shelf, that um, people are looking at you over others? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a very uh, relevant but tough question. Um, and what you want to do is stand out for the right reasons. Um, and you want to, again, people engage with brands in many different ways. Um, and when you are a smaller, non multinational where you don't have the same budgets, uh, you know, obviously your on-shelf presence is so important. And and, and again, um, when people are attracted to a wall of offerings, will your presentation encourage them to to pick it up? So that's the first, first challenge. Or they walk into a bar and they're looking at a bar, a back bar with so much whiskey. It's like, how how are you going to stand it? So, so, you know, it's a key thing. And also you can have the world's best whiskey He's amazing whiskey, and you don't put in the right packaging, mm. the, people won't have the right experience because you experience whiskey. It's environmental. It's every every aspect of what you deliver. Do, for me, uh, delivers that experience that they'll remember or won't remember, or you know, so forth. So, so when they're looking at your bottle and they're sampling your whiskey, that's part of the experience. There's a lot of times where you walk into a bar, a whiskey bar, they will obviously. Let's say they'll pour you the drink, but they'll also leave you the bottle, so you can examine the bottle and, and engage with it in that way. Um, and this, oh, interesting! At the same time, if you're ever you know in someone's house and they're you know talking about a new whiskey or something like that, they'll always you know you'll you'll, you'll tactically like, touch the bottle. It's 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 a full sensory experience. So the whiskey obviously is a key part of it, but how you represent that liquid in your packaging has a massive influence on the perception of the quality and, and everything that you're trying to achieve as a brand. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a skin, it's, it's the facade that you need to understand, you know, how consumers will perceive that. And I've been involved with brands who have taken very radical approaches to the bottle and try to disrupt the category and so forth. And it has backfired them because consumer reaction was, why are they trying so hard to make this look like something else? 
the liquid must be, you know, cracked. So, so again, you need to understand your consumers. You need to understand how they perceive what type of bottle it is, you know, what, what the label, what the, you know, the cork, you know, versus a twist top, you know, there's lots of things like that. So if you're in the premium space, all aspects of your experience, the ways of the bottle, like, you know, it's something that you want for sustainability is have a lighter bottle, but then the perception of quality is diminished by people pick it up if it's too light. So it's a really hard one to, to round off or, or secondary packaging is like, yo, the drive is to eliminate second packaging. But if you're paying a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars for, for a bottle, you want they demand the secondary packaging. <laughs> so, it's absolutely so, so yeah. you know, while while there's a lot of interest in, in sustainability and being as, as as green as possible, the consumers aren't driving that as of yet in the super premium or the premium into the market. So so it's a key aspect of it. And again, for us, uh, we wanted this combination of old and new. Uh, and, and back then there was no one really doing obviously things have changed. A lot of people doing lots of different things now. Um, we wanted to have, you know, a, an old style bottle and kind of a standout label and, you know, went to designers that, that had never done anything in Irish whiskey that I always liked and so forth. And we came up with the, the design and I suppose it's evolved and, and devolved and gone different ways since then. But, uh, yeah, it, it's something that, that is, is, you know, put a lot of time and effort into and, and, uh, is a key part of making it stand out just as much as ensuring that the whiskey is as good as it possibly can be as well. I mean, you've answered about 6 million follow-up questions that I'd already had in my head. So um, well done. That was a really comprehensive and really thoughtful um, response um, to what we're dealing with with the shelf appeal. There's so many considerations, so many things to play in part. We touched on sustainability. Um, we also touched on premiumization. And I think what Teeling does really well and it, and exactly the aim that you have communicated here, something that's traditional, but bringing it to something more contemporary and, and relevant and, and young, I, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head with the, the Teeling brand. I having been, I went to BCB and I saw you um, having um, your, your trade fair stand there and the physicality. I see you online. Of course, we've taken some amazing photography of some of your bottles. I think it's fab. Like, I guess my, how do you manage to have so many different collections? You've got the small batch, unconventional collection, you've got vintage reserve, you've got your limited editions, you've got this amazing Explorer series that you've rolled out. I think this was a, a Japanese edition, but across the board, you managed to create this consistency, even though there's such different, yet unique collections. What? How on earth do you manage that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. I I, I don't know. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's you know obviously our core branding it has to be consistent across what we do. Even though we we debossed it, embossed it on glass, rather than printed and so forth. But the look and feel, which is our core, you know, lock up or logo, uh, is is a consistent. Uh, um, let's say point that we've used across multiple different types of balls, multiple types of expressions, you know, at, you know 40 euros to 4,000 euros. But a, a, again, you know, when you look at it, it looks very, you, you know, it's a teeling straight away. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I suppose we've been lucky to work with a quite tight team of designers and be very prescriptive in what we want uh, and, and how it should look uh, that's allowed us to. And I think the series... Again, for us, it gives us a focal point so we know what it's going to look like and then we can change it from iterations going forward. So it's about getting the first one right and then the rest can you can tweak and the changes go along. Um, um, so so I think that that has been good for us. It's been good, hopefully, for collectors and people understand then, oh, yeah, well, we know this is your explorers and it's going to be something weird and wacky from a weird part of the world like Brazil and Marana Har. You know, hardwoods to our Japanese uh, mo moji so soshu uh, casks and all this yeah. stuff. But uh, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a challenge. And, and again, it's, it's you know, we've done a lot. Um, um, and we're probably at a stage now of, of, of sense checking of, okay, well, we've done all these different things. Well, what, what do we want to do going forward? And what do consumers, you know, buy into the best? Um, um, so so it's it's... It's a constant learning and and trying things and see what works, what doesn't work, and so forth. And and you know, I suppose we're literally literally at a stage now of 
pardon pun, distilling down our, our, our offerings and, and, and focusing on stuff that we feel, you know, can live, you know, in a very competitive environment now, with, even with an Irish whiskey. And that will continue to, for us to stand out again for the right reasons. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned your lockup, which of course is that amazing Phoenix emblem. Um, seems so intrinsic to your brand identity. Can you tell me what the Phoenix is about? Yeah, yeah. So, well, the Phoenix is about um, bringing things back to life. And um, the, the logic was, you know, we wanted to bring stealing whiskey back to life, uh, but also bring the stilling in Dublin back to life and to put Dublin as a, as a distilling centre back on the global scale of, you know, urban distillation, which it was uh, back in the 18th, 19th century until, you know, the last distillery shut its doors in 1976. So I suppose that was kind of the mission, um, um, and we managed to achieve it. But you know, again, it's it, it symbolizes you know everything that we're about about uh, you know in a way giving back and bringing areas back to life and bringing new people coming in, uh, rejuvenating uh, uh, Ireland, Dublin, you know, other urban centres around the world and so forth. So it's also around sustainability, of reusing you know casts in different ways and lots of different things that tap into I suppose our intrinsic values that we've been trying to, you know, represent from the start. And it, in a way, it, it, it happens by accident in terms of being a core lockup uh, because the original design was for something to something totally different. Now, it didn't really feel reflected what, what I wanted to uh, represent as modern Ireland and as, uh, you know, what we're doing in Dublin. And it uh, was, you know, our concept of the phoenix uh, rising from a pot still uh, that, you know, came about. And uh, thankfully now it's, we use as just on the Phoenix on its own to represent the brand. So uh, hopefully it's becoming an iconic kind of a uh, symbol. I would say the same thing as, as someone who's in, incredibly passionate about branding and coming from a marketing background, that's, that's the, the goal, isn't it? To, to not even have teething displayed, to just have that recognition, whether it's through color aesthetic and um, an emblematic icon like the Phoenix, I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and particularly will come into fruition as you start to scale more globally and, and gain that recognition, which we will talk about in a little bit. <laughs> Before we do, you mentioned earlier about this emotional connection that we need to create with our consumers um, and the sensory considerations that we need to, to, uh, to play a part in packaging. Mm. But what we don't explore, or perhaps perhaps it is something that Tealing is exploring, is how does that connection overlap into the digital world because uh, let's face it those 21 year olds are on the tiktoks on the i hate to put that such stereotype on it but it is really a digital native world that generation how how can packaging if if you haven't already thought about it already is there an opportunity for those to work more closely together well yeah look i think obviously modern uh, ways of connecting with people and <clears throat> how people discover brands have changed and will continue to change and are constantly changing. And even from, you know, 11 years, it's like a different world. Um, um, and so obviously how you turn up digitally is, 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 is equally as important as how you turn up on, on people's shop, because that's where they're going to discover. And that's where you want them to discover your story. And people now are relying on not, they don't want companies telling them about the brand they want other people they want people that they trust or they have a, a connection with and they follow um to tell them about things so so mm. there's a business that has emerged around that um uh, which is which is a challenge for for companies to crack into um but there is also an opportunity um, and you can see brands who have done very very well in a short period of time the whole celebrity endorsed brands because they use their yes. platform to cut through all the noise and you know i always say that this industry is like a marathon you takes a long time you did the right things over and over again while these you know i suppose digital led influencer models cut through all that and fast track things a lot quicker if you have the distribution power behind you and um, to take advantage of that as well so so it's it's really interesting and challenging but how can you use your packaging to to drive it is is, is a very good, good point and obviously people are looking at uh, NFCs and you know QR codes and different ways to engage and and to find so people pick it up, you know, and then get their phone to it and and again can they get your 
brand story or message across in a very concise and interesting way. So that's, that is an opportunity. Um, but the problem is probably technology is moving either quicker or, you know, it's very hard to keep on top of this, uh, because what you do one, one, one year might be very, you know, outdated soon afterwards. So it's, it's, it's because things are changing very, very quickly. It's, it's how you can do it, but you know, you can see labels, uh, in the wine industry and so forth. The ones which are doing well are ones which are, you know, uh, that you're able to engage with by using your, your whatever device to do so. So, so I think it's probably underrepresented within whiskey and there is probably a great opportunity. And also let's say even blockchain and different ways to, to, to actually understand exactly where it's come from to give you the confidence that, you know, when you're buying something expensive, that it, it is what it is. So, so yeah, there's definitely absolutely. an extra layer. One, to tell the story, and two is consumer trust or to allow that transparency that people are looking for about where it's come from and how it's actually got there, even the person who bottled it, like, you know, so it's actual picture or somebody to engage with who it is. So, so there's definitely opportunities. It's messy, it's complicated, uh, uh, and, and there will be brands that will conquer it ahead of other people and they'll have a first mover advantage. We're probably not doing enough of it because, you know, um, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole quite quickly and spend a lot of time and effort on that. And you might take your eye off other things that you need to be doing. So, but it is something that we are very mindful of and we're keeping tabs on, but we haven't tracked it yet. Yeah. But it's interesting what, when we've um, talked about it, you've highlighted both this need or this, this resurgence around influencer marketing and around the promotional side of things, but actually equally there's that educational side of things of understanding traceability um, the, the, and, and creating transparency around it. So there is, there's more that digital can offer, but I agree there's, there's, there's more to come, of course. Um, so I definitely watch the space. Um, as a final note, I really do want to um, move over to the exciting news. Of course, Bacardi have always had a, a stake in Teeling. You've obviously caught their eye in terms of your success in this industry, in this, um, and as a core part of their portfolio, they want to be a part of your business. But a month ago, I would say, perhaps at the tail end of 2023, they've really upped their stake. Um, and they've increased their investment. Um, they've become a majority holder. This is exciting news for Teeling. Um, in the meantime, I also think that you're expanding as well. So you've I've, I've read that you're expanding your production or your maturi- uh, maturation capacity. So you've got growth in mind, I would say, if, if I'm going to put that in a nutshell. Um, tell me about that. But where where are you, where are we at as Teeling that's now con- very well connected with a world leading brand like Bacardi, a fantastic um, um, business? What does that mean now for for you and Stephen and the business? Yeah, well, it's, it hasn't happened overnight. Uh, you know, I, I first met Bacardi. I think it was two thousand thirteen or fourteen, um, and. Uh, I suppose the original uh, involvement happened in 2017 uh, when um, they came in as a minority investor and we started working with them in the US. Um, so uh, we got to know each other. Um, they got to know the brand. Uh, we got to know uh, their company um, and how they do things. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of shared values there because it's a family owned business themselves, obviously, much bigger than ourselves um but you know they don't have necessarily that the same pressures of a listed company like a diageo it's quarter quarter you know take a longer term views on different things and so forth so so um um we took you know time to get to know each other and it was actually uh, at the end of 2022 uh that uh, they increased their shareholding so it was just we didn't oh right we didn't okay. it. so so we've been working with them now as in, in a slightly different perspective um since then and i suppose the, the logic of doing that was uh um we were looking at again you know i set up the business with a view of making a global brand making tea and whiskey into a global brand you know in the premium space and, and my view is you know that that's a goal how do we get there um and can can we do it all ourselves or do we need some help um and you know the hardest thing 
no matter what, the whiskey, you know, the branding, all that kind of stuff. If, if you can't get your product onto shelf or you don't have some of the distribution strength, it's it's very hard, you know, to 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 go to where you want to go. But we've done, we've built very strong foundations. We in the whiskey community in, in a lot of different markets. And I suppose we were looking at oh, how do we step up and and you know make it you know a little bit of bigger brand and go after different route to market opportunities in in markets where we feel we're established and we have a good brand equity and uh, that's what we're doing now and that we're changing some of our route to markets as we did in the us back in 2017 when they first came in we're going into more markets like in germany benelux sweden uh, poland um a range of what I'm trying to remember. Uh, but there are markets where we feel there's a great opportunity for us to work with them. So we're adding something to them, but also they're adding something to us and we're building on on, on great partnerships. And we've had some great partners in these places, like 10-year relationships, uh, working with, with, with distributors there who believed in us and have been a key part of our journey, which is the hardest part. Uh, again, is, is, is the relationships and, and ending relationships as you as you move on. Um, but we feel, you know, now is the time to go after the opportunity for for teething in those markets and for Irish whiskey and for premium spirits in general. So, so it's, exo- it's, good. it's exciting. It's, it's exciting. It does change things that I'm going to change and so forth. But, um, um, you know, hopefully it's the right thing for the brands. Hopefully it's, uh, um, it, there will always be challenges with uh, change the route to market. doesn't matter if you're whatever brand you are. It's always a hard, hard thing to do. Uh, so, uh, we think probably the next 12 months will be a bit of a challenge, but hopefully we're set up for success as we come out of that. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And all the experience that you brought from, from you as a family working in distilleries and, and incredibly the intelligence that you will be gaining and make those insights from Bacardi will absolutely, um, set you up for, for success. So uh, I'm very excited to see where where that will take you and moving forward. So am I. And of course, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they have been very open about saying that you know you and Stephen are still going to be leading the ship here. It's it's not a takeover. It's that there's very much still keeping that essence of of what you're trying to create and what you were trying to create with them um, with teaming in the first place. So. I think on that note, if I was to ask you one last question, it would be if you were to encapsulate teething in one word or phrase, what would it be? I mean, I asked another um, and it turned out to be a full three blown sentence paragraph. So, <laughs> but if you were, if it, what, what would you say? How would you describe teething? Good question, uh, and not prepared for that one. So, <laughs> well, you know, our our goal has always been to be different, um, and to be different for 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 the right reason. Um, and you know, the vision involves you know creating world class whiskies and putting Irish and Dublin whiskey, you know, uh, at the forefront of minds uh, as as you touched on that premium whiskey trend happens around the world uh, and, you know, doing our part for the evolution of Irish whiskey um, so that consumers come in and they can stay within Irish whiskey and they can only do that if there's interesting differentiated propositions that can all be multinationals, can all be Perno and all the great things that they're doing, which they're trying to do, but they need smaller, interesting guys, because if we, if, if the likes of Teeling weren't there, you know, the bigger guys have no need to innovate. So, so, so I think it's, uh, hopefully we're paving the way for other new entrants to do something different and, and to, to drive that choice and, and the breath that consumers demand within our issues. That's a short answer. <laughs> I mean, I have done this a few times now and everyone seems to find that one of the most difficult answer. <laughs> We just want one word. You can't really shut us up. <laughs> yeah. Well, you ask well, an Irish person for one word, you, you're definitely going to get at least a <laughs> five hundred. So. Well, Jack, on that note, I want to thank you absolutely for for joining us, for sharing your story, sharing the insights that you've you've or a snippet of the insights that you've gained over the last twelve years, almost. Um, and just to really thank you for the contribution you're making to the industry. I think it's a really powerful one. I think the goals that you're setting out, you're absolutely 
um, achieving. Um, and I absolutely get the feeling that you're not done yet. So um, definitely not watch done. the space. Definitely not done. A lot more to do. Um, but uh, uh, look, thanks for having on. Hopefully uh, 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 my words of wisdom make sense. And uh, look, uh, it's, a, it's an exciting uh, industry. Um, and I'm just proud to be able to represent our family and, and the category. Thank you.